welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate the official launch of Bread and Water, an essay collection by D. Hobsbawm Smith. My name is Elsa Johnston, and I'm the interim director of the University of Regina Press. And in my role, I have the enviable pleasure of sitting down and reading our books before they're launched. And D, I can honestly say, I devoured every word that you served on the page. Now we're going to start the event shortly, but before we do, it's important to acknowledge our shared existence on this land. University of Regina Press is located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota nations, and homeland of the Métis people. Tonight, we're happy to welcome Jeanette Lines as this evening's guest moderator. Jeanette Lines is the author of seven collections of poetry. Her most recent book of poetry is Bedlam Cowslip, the John Clare Poems, which received the 2016 Saskatchewan Arts Board Poetry Award. Jeanette will provide a brief introduction to Bread and Water, which will be followed by a pre-recorded reading from Dee and an audience Q&A session. Throughout the evening, we welcome you to participate in the discussion via the, the chat function there. However, we ask that you please be mindful as we strive to create a safe communal space for our authors and guests. Please show kindness and respect to everyone in the audience. Although I, I don't think that's going to be a problem with tonight's gathering, but it's important to bear in mind there's also a quick reminder that this event is being live streamed to the internet, so please make sure to turn your cameras off um, if you don't want to appear in the video. And finally, a reminder that you can purchase a copy of Bread and Water by visiting mcnallyrobinson.com and a link to the book there is also provided here um, in the chat. So without further ado, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to you now, Jeanette. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm, I'm so happy to, to be here tonight. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, uh, to have this conversation with Dee about her wonderful book, Bread and Water. And I too devoured the book. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce Dee and the format for tonight will be that um, you will hear a, a pre-recorded reading that Dee will do from her book. And uh, then uh, Dee and I will have a conversation and in about the last 10 minutes, um, we'll have um, opportunity for you to uh, post your questions you might have for Dee in the, in the chat. So, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just stoked to be here for the past 18 months. We've all been isolated and Dee's book is so much, um, of course, it's, it's about cooking and about food, um, but it's so much about community and we just, and connectedness, our connectedness to each other. So I think the time for this, the timing for this, for Dee's book is just perfect. Dee Hobbs von Smith is an award-winning author, essayist, poet, fictionist, chef, curious cook, food writer, and runner who lives rurally west of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. An ex-restaurateur and longtime freelance journalist, she has written eight books, including Food Shed and Edible Alberta Alphabet, The Curious Cook at Home, and Wildness Rushing in Poems. Uh, so you're in for a huge treat, and we will now hear Dee um, read from Bread and Water. Hi, everybody. I'm Dee Hobsbawm Smith. I know you're out there. It is rather disconcerting, as some of you do know, to be talking to a screen and trusting that there is an audience out there. But I, I know that you're out there. So I would like to thank you for dialing in, clicking in, tuning in to attend this virtual launch of my new book, Bread and Water Essays, published by the University of Regina Press. 
So thank you so much for deciding to spend a little bit of time with me here in Dogpatch, west of Saskatoon. I live on Treaty 6 territory. It's the traditional home of the Métis Nation and of the Cree, uh, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, Salto, and the Dene people. And I acknowledge my link and connection to them, to the peoples, and to the sky, the trees, the plants, uh, the land, and the animals that surround us. We really are all one. So this reading is going to be two excerpts, but before I get to them, I have a few thank yous. There's always thank yous because many of you know it takes a village, no, it takes a, a city a city to uh, write a book and, and bring it to birthing. So I'd like to thank, uh, in no particular order, uh, Sask Arts, the Saskatchewan Writers Guild, um, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Writers Union of Canada, and I'd like to thank the University of Regina Press for its faith in this work and in me. It's, I, as I grow older, I realize how difficult it is to bring a book into, into being as there are more and more writers with important things to say. So my, my deepest thanks and humility goes to the press and in particular to uh, Kelly Laycock and to Kendra Ward for her very sharp copy editing. I'd also like to thank ZG Stories uh, for their wonderful work in marketing and PR, way above, above and beyond the call, particularly there, Sarah Dunn and Nicole. I know you're back there somewhere, Nicole, managing things for this event, so thank you so much to you. I also um, would love to thank my husband, Dave Margotius. He's my first reader uh, and editor and my partner in my life, as well as uh, a, a critic, as many of you know, uh, a critic of the highest order of, of all things written. And I owe him uh, a great debt of gratitude and love. I also would like to thank you and thank and acknowledge my writing group of longstanding Visible Inc, the 600 members of that other members of that group for their their camaraderie and friendship and their sharp eyes and their pointed comments as together we have worked over the years to uh, write our books, revise our books, uh, our manuscripts, and bring them to birth as books. So thank you, all of you. You know who you are and you know how, I know how hard you are working on your own work as well as making time to work on mine with me. And then finally, I'd like to thank the editors and the publishers of the magazines, the newspapers, and the literary magazines where some of these essays appeared in early, early stages. Uh, and also, I would like to thank Jeanette Lines, who is waiting in the wings as our moderator this evening. Thank you for doing this, Jeanette. I know you and technology are not bosom buddies. But I also owe Jeanette a, a debt of gratitude in her role as director of the MFA in writing at the University of Saskatchewan and in her role as professor there because it was under her tutelage that some of these, three of these essays, I think, were originally written. So hats off to Jeanette. So I'm going to read excerpts from two separate essays for this, this reading. Two, because while this is a book about food, and it is a book about food, absolutely and indubitably, it's also a memoir. Uh, and it's in it, I use food as a metaphor and as a mirror and as a way into examining life, not just my life and not just my move from Calgary to Saskatchewan and my life before and after that, but also life in the greater sense and some of the larger questions that we ask ourselves about parenting and uh, aging. Do we age gracefully or do we go down in a blaze of thunder? And uh, how, how, we, how we raise our children and how we parent ourselves and, how, and our stance in the world above and beyond how we choose our food and what we choose to eat and how we cook it. So if you find yourself going, well, why would I read a book about food? I'm not a foodie. Maybe you are at heart. A, we all eat. B, this book, I hope, addresses the larger questions 
some of them for you so that you will, in the reading, you will find some humor and some wit and perhaps something that you resonate with. So it is a, a literary work as well as a, a culinary work. And I am indebted as always to the late MFK Fisher uh, for her inspirational writing that I came to at an early age before I was ever a writer while I was still a cook in training. Uh, so MFK has long since gone on to the, the great library in, in, in the beyond. Uh, but to her, I do, I, I acknowledge my, my gratitude and, and the debt that I owe her as, as a writer, as well as many other writers, but, but MFK in particular. So an excerpt first from Watershed, which is, it addresses the water in the title of this book and Dave's and my arrival in Saskatchewan from other places. Watershed. Dave and I arrive in Saskatchewan in July 2010 on a sweltering hot day. We arrive to dry land dust as the uninvited guest at every meal, to darkness so thick it wraps us like a duvet, to the scent of sage and wolf willows, to sunlight that slants across wide summer skies, leaving shadows of owls and coyotes in its wake. The excitement that buoyed me through packing the house in Calgary slowly deflates. What comes in its place is that long evening light and the delicate English rose of early morning sunshine. Their fragile peace is upended by a ragged battalion of barn cats bounding to greet me. Behind them trails my parents' farm dog, Amigo, a great Pyrenees who'd never adapt to town life and is left behind to guard us. Will this suffice until I find my footing? I left Calgary to help my parents as they age and to live a slower life myself. Ironic that, as I also leave behind my food writing career, where I wrote often about slow food and its global calling to change our lives and attitudes. But mostly, I left Calgary to pursue my dream of writing poems, essays, novels, short stories. I bring my cat and dog, but leave my sons behind, both full grown. Is it selfish to leave? No. Engrossed in their own burgeoning lives, they'll miss me less than I'll miss them. But on arriving at the farm where my grandparents had lived, I realized that my loss is eased in part by my newly found sense of belonging, something I never felt in Calgary. Here, the feeling is bolstered by them, my ancestors, the invisible ones who silent, silently move the door ajar. We are surrounded by ghosts, Dave and I, but they are benign. We sleep in a room my parents slept in, the air initially heavy with a sense of trespass. We live under a blanketing swath of stars I don't recognize, so many I can only marvel. We are surrounded by rutted country lanes without street signs or lights that at night could lead anywhere or nowhere. A week after we arrive, the rains begin. My grandparents lived here for 30 years amid animals, grain fields, graying barn boards, a garden. It rarely rained. The only water for miles stood stagnant in occasional sloughs and the dugout or hid down the well. On midsummer visits when I was a small girl, walking to the pump house for water, my grandmother and I swung buckets between us on smooth wooden handles. The bucket's white metal was carved russet by oxidation, the metal thinned like membranes before childbirth. She wore equanimity as her robe, corseted with the implacable gaze of the stars that oversaw her long country life. Each afternoon, I scrambled into the old green mercury with her to check the mail, the air inside the car hot and heavy, dust infiltrating at each window and gathering on the dust on the dash and cushions. She sat tall at the wheel of a grand limousine as we cruised past the barn and along the verge of the field and up the driveway lined with aspens and poplars. You jump out and check the mailbox for me, Liebling. I'm just an old lady. Her deep voice was soft and rounded, 
patient vowels like the butter she slathered on my corn. I carried the newspaper and the mysterious sealed envelopes into the farm kitchen. Its walls were yellow, slatted cupboards from floor to ceiling. A wood-burning stove hulked by the north wall. In its reservoir, iron red water. As an adult, I paint every kitchen yellow. All right, that was just a taste of watershed. It goes on to when we encounter the flood less than a year after we arrive to dry land, we are surrounded by water. So that is the water that, that threads its way throughout this book. I'm going to move now to a, a brief excerpt from Cooking for James. This essay was written during my, my work at the university earning my MFA, and it first appeared in an early version in Gastronomica out of the University of California at Berkeley, the, uh, their, food culture, their food culture magazine. So cooking for James, the James of the title uh, was James Barber, since deceased. He began as a food writer and restaurant critic in Vancouver and went on to create a national audience as culinary tutor on the CBC on Morningside to Don Heron and then the late Peter Zosky. And from then he springboarded into becoming the urban peasant as he became a television personality uh, riding in the wake of, of other cooks and chefs like Julia Child. So he was a big deal and I met him when I was at cooking school in Vancouver in the early 1980s. I was a kid, just a kid, and I stumbled into a cooking demonstration he was doing along 4th Avenue West in a uh, kitchenware store. And he was cooking brunch for a crowd and they were very well healed, the place smelled of garlic, and I lined up in the queue to, to say hi, because I knew who he, who he was. And out of the blue, blurted out this invitation to come and have dinner with me, with me, a foolish young cook in training. So we pick up the story where I'm going out to, on my shopping. So from Cooking for James. It was still raining when I locked my bike outside the liquor store. Inside, I agonized for 20 minutes, knowing I was about to spend most of my month's grocery budget. I finally sprang for a famously expensive French white burgundy I'd never felt quite up to trying before, intimidated not only by its hefty price tag, but also by its reputation and high score with the wine experts. Unconvinced my student palate would do it justice. But those attributes and its provenance seemed perfectly aligned with tonight's endeavor. Dinner with James Barber. The wall clock read three when I maneuvered my bike into the narrow hall of my tiny apartment. This was third and you, those of you who know Vancouver, uh, in the, on the west side uh, in Kitsilano. I found the crepes recipe in my class binder and clutched it in one hand as I pulled ingredients from the fridge with the other. And I groaned. I was out of eggs. The clock's hour hand was a spur and my nerves were already wound tight. The trip back to 4th Avenue and the health food store took just a few minutes, but the lineup at the only open cashier's till was the normal weekend logjam. The woman in front of me had two whining kids, a cart full of soy cheese pizzas, mini yogurts by the case, and a dozen school-sized bottles of juice. I saw her eyeing my single carton of eggs perched alone on the conveyor belt, but then she looked away and concentrated on picking lint off the hood of her daughter's rain jacket. And at that moment, I vowed again never to have kids. I have since softened my stance on that. I have two great sons. But at the time, I vowed never to have kids, to concentrate on my career and become a famous chef, to give all my change to panhandlers, to let people cut in front of me at the video store and at the grocery store with impunity and a gracious smile. Will there be anything else? The cashier asked when my turn finally came. I hesitated and snagged a handful of chocolate bars and flung them on the conveyor belt. Can you wait just a sec, I asked. I bolted to the back cooler and grabbed the last glass pint bottle of whipping cream. I'm cooking a French dinner, I said to the scowling clerk. Crepes, that'll be $15.50. What? 
for eggs and cream, organic eggs, and that's Avalon Dairy whipping cream, six bars of dark Ghirardelli chocolate, 15, all right, all right, I got it. I counted out coins and tightly folded bills sequestered in my wallet. The last of my food allowance and my month's bus fare as well. I'd be biking to school for the rest of the month. In the kitchen, the batter for the crepes looked flawless. The cream sauce bubbled, the carrots waited to be sauteed. But my imagination kept intervening, smearing James's pen and ink drawings from his cookbook into bizarre live action cartoons. Crepe filling, I heard him say in that gruff tiger's purr, is a vehicle for improv. Make a cream sauce, fry some asparagus, add some diced chicken or smoked trout. Snazzy, simple, sexy. In my mind's eye, he invited a young blonde who looked a lot like me onto a stage set up as a kitchen, similar to the store earlier that day where I'd seen him cooking, and similar to the television set when he'd host the urban peasant several, several years later. Grinning, again in my mind's eye, he fed her enormous mouthfuls, cream dripping, dripping down the fork to his cuff, probably down her mouth too peeling and slicing carrots in a frenzy. All I could think about was the look of pleasure on the real James's face as he ate my crepes. As the carrots softened in a bed of butter, I picked up four chocolate bars, smashed them down on the counter, pulled off the wrappers and dropped the broken bits into a small pot with the rest of the cream. Chocolate ganache for the dessert crepes. On the radio, John Cougar was singing Jack and Diane. Little ditty. The whole world was caught up in love, infatuated with the idea of coupledom, wheels spinning in tandem. Cooks had the inside track. James Barber's success proved that people invariably let down their guard while enjoying a yummy meal cooked for them. Tonight, I was boarding that train. I made a fresh pot of coffee, lit the front burner, tossed a knob of butter in my pan, attempted that insouciant swirling motion I had so envied, added the batter and swirled again. The batter didn't swirl. It set in jagged arms and indentations like the inlets along the Georgia Strait. I tried to loosen it, recalling chef's admonitions that the pan had to ready itself that the first crepe was invariably spoiled to make enough batter to account for loss. To account for loss, I was only 23, but I'd been struck by the phrase, wondered if, extent, if it extended to people, to families, to children, to pets, to careers, how to plan your life with sufficient resources to account for loss. Who would want to? I tried again, failed again. I added more milk and tried again. The third crepe broke as I flipped it. The fourth landed on the floor as did the fifth. 10 years, 10 years, it felt like 10 years. 10 minutes later, I was sweating, my pulse up again, my coffee pot empty, my hands shaking like a junkie's. Of 12 crepes that eventually made it onto the plate, six were worth using. Six were sufficient, maybe. I knew my guest's reputation, his famous appetite. I recharged the coffee pot again, refilled my mug and set to work cleaning up. An hour later, I laid four crepes in a baking dish, stuffed them with the cooled carrots, poured on the sauce, turned on the oven and spooled the ganache into the remaining crepes. My pleasure attenuated by increasing anxiety. I paced the hardwood floor, looked out the window every five minutes, trying to see through the twilight. I could hear raindrops. By seven, the doorbell hadn't yet rung. When I opened the fridge, the burgundy waiting all alone convinced me I had earned the first glass. Survivors do. 40 minutes later, the wine was half gone. By 8.30, my blood sugars plummeting, a headache creeping up, I put the crepes into the oven, then ate the last of the chocolate cream sauce, dipping salvaged pieces of crepe into the pot like a penitent before the grail. I pulled the crepes out of the oven half an hour later and topped off my glass. The clock read 9.30, then 10. 
At 10.30, I finally ate the meal I prepared, alone, sitting on the floor with the TV on, my plate of soggy crepes balanced on my lap, wine glass on the floorboards beside me. I barely slept. At school on Monday, I didn't mention the fiasco, although I did tell chef I'd successfully made crepes. A month later, I was at my stove before class, radio blaring, and I heard James's growling baritone interrupt Zosky's voice. Nothing is as seductive as cassoulet. I visualized him stirring a pot of cannellini beans and crocking his finger at an attractive brunette working the soundboard in the radio stu studio. You fraud, I thought. I added ginger and cumin to my lentils and turned off the radio before I ate. That's not the end of that essay. You want to read the rest of it to find out what happens because things do happen. So thanks again for listening. I'm going to turn this back over to the wonderful folks in charge of things for the evening, uh, Jeanette Lines and Nicole from Zedgy Stories. Thanks for listening. Thank you for buying my book. Buy my book. It's a great Christmas present and you're going to love it. Talk soon. <clears throat>
and poetry while I try to make an assessment of where they really belong. And in some cases, they tip one way and then I tip them back the other way. Like uh, Bello, for instance, I wrote after reading Howl, right, by, <laughs> by uh, Allen Ginsberg. And I thought at first that it was a poem because it was written after reading that amazing poem of his. But it, it runs in this, you could call it a prose poem, I suppose you could call it a prose poem. It's a pretty powerful piece to read out loud. And if you're at all squeamish, you'll want to, you know, gird your loins for it. But I think poetry is, is where I live as a writer. And it's, it's hard to not invoke the natural world when where I live, you know, out here in, in Dogpatch, the natural world is so, it's so present. It's so present. You know, I look outside and, you know, the hummingbirds in season, everything is, it's right there, right in our faces. And of course, with the flood, that was exacerbated. Yes, I remember, um, I remember being out of your place and, 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 and seeing all the, the, the old rusting vehicles and tractors half underwater. And it was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> I think the water is maybe all gone now. I'm not sure. The water Haven't been gone. Yes, yes. Well, um, I, I just want to give um, those of, uh, present tonight a sense of just the um, the richness of, of thematic richness in Dee's book. I mean, food, the natural world, family, faith, time, aging, loss, um, very painful, um, you know, writing about loss as well. Um, parenting, as Dee mentioned earlier, gender, um, it, you know, in, in, the, um, in the industry, um, community and and also um also forgiveness so there's just all these these beautiful strands that are woven together in in the book um d was the title always bread and water or did you titles are hard did, did was it did you always just know or did you go through a whole bunch of placeholders it just arrived it just arrived and i knew right from the get-go that it was right and i didn't feel like i had to justify it because there was, as you said, so many strands going, going through it. So when it showed up, I thought, oh, okay. And that was the end of it. A yeah. pleasant change from trying on a million different titles, I got to say. Yeah. Well, it, it just, it feels, it feels right. I mean, it feels perfect, right? It just, it just, it encompasses so many of those, um, so many of those strands um, of your life and, and just the lyricism of your, of your book. And I love the, the all the, the, all the people, in these essays, um, you're you're you're. I mean, you're a fiction writer too, of course, um, and your eye for just just social things and and people is is just it just blew me away. I, I can't I can't resist. Uh, okay, I'll pick one in the interest of time. Your the descriptions of people who you've encountered in your life. Uh, there was a um, a striking blonde woman with cheekbones sharp enough to slice paper. <laughs> oh wow and and that's just one example i mean these these people are they just they just step off the page like vibrant so maybe that's your your that's your attentiveness that's your attentive eye to the world but also i marvel that you, you must have a phenomenal memory or have you for years kept notebooks or do you just do you just have this incredible memory for these these people and the details and their personalities and quirks well it's a combination of things um I have, I have boxes of journals, yes, with all kinds of notes in them. Uh, and some of these essays date back a few years and were published in earlier forms before I sat down and revised them after I became a better writer. Um, but, but part of it was pulling, pulling on, on memory strings. You're absolutely right about that. And it's amazing what things start to unravel in, in my brain when, when I start thinking about something, you know, it goes around the corner like a good essay and go, oh, I'd forgotten all about that. So it has been for me, as well as I know for a couple of friends of mine, uh, a really good tool for preserving memory and, and coming back to memories that I had even, couldn't even think of that had, they, they had eluded me for years. So con uh, yeah, another example of a whole bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, okay, well, I'll, I'll ask you this, this question. Um, so the essays, that, as, as you've referenced, have were written over a period of, of years. Um, how then putting them together to, to make this book, it just coheres beautifully and it, it kind of tracks your journey and home and uh, it's bookended by a lovely preface and an epilogue. 
Um, did, was that a, a, a bit of a, a jigsaw puzzle or did, did the essays feel, to sequence them as you have, they feel like they kind of had a natural flow or is that tough? It was tough. It was tough. Um, the bookends that started and ended were the last thing I wrote, last things I wrote. Um, and they, they both uh, came after my, my father passed away almost two years ago. Uh, and once I had them in place, it helped to kind of fill in the gaps, but, but organizing things and getting them into the right order. Jigsaw is about the right word. I, I tried all kinds of things. I thought, well, maybe I should have all the cooking stuff at one end and everything else, you know, and that felt completely odd. It was just, just a question of trial and error until, until the balance felt like it had appeared, you know, the, the, the teeter-totter effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it works. It, it, it's a beautiful sequence um, of essays um, as well. And another thing that really astonished me is, was, is, is the voice through, through, through the book. Um, in the intro, I, I think you write, um, the, the essays offer a meditative and personal voice um, that bears witness and poses questions. And it, it, is, it is a remarkably um, just coherent kind of voice. It just sounds like, just like, well, obviously it sounds like you, but uh, I, I really marveled at the voice, given the essays were written over, over a period of time. And um, yes, there's, there are a lot of questions that drive the essays, which really energize them. Um, if you had to say to the folks out there tonight, what, were, what are the, some of the main questions um, that, that are posed in, in, in your book? Oh, that's a big one. Um, well, ambition, for one. I think we saw little bits of that in that Cooking for James excerpt that I, that I read. Ambition and how to, have, how to live a meaningful life which sounds kind of vague, but you know, I fumble my way through it. And, and I think I've been blessed to feel like I've been doing things that, that have mattered uh, for most of my adult life. Um, certainly family, raising children, parenting myself into the best semblance of wholeness that I can manage, <laughs> we're all broken at one point or another, uh, family, belonging, finding a home, you know, as, as a daughter of an Air Force family, uh, I and my siblings, we moved around a lot. And even after I had grown and established my own home, I found myself moving every couple of years going, okay, well, well uh, this is, it's time to move now. So finding, finding a place that feels like home, and it surprised me beyond belief that it ended up being Dryland, Saskatchewan. I thought that Calgary was going to be it, but in Alberta, I kept looking and thinking, all right, is it here? Is it this house? Is it that? You know, I'd drive around as a, as a writer and visit a lot of food producers, sit on a lot of ranch house steps thinking, maybe this is it. But finding, finding home here in Saskatchewan was the biggest surprise of all. Mm -hmm. And that that's so resonant too. And uh, uh, another yellow kitchen. And I see, I think a yellow living room. Behind yeah. You there. Yeah. 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 And I've been in your I've been in your awesome house, and uh, I've I've had the pleasure of eating your incredible food. I love the essay where you invite me over. Just we could order out just you know because it is intimidating to uh, think that you're going to uh, uh, make food for a, for a chef. Um, do do you? Um, I love all the essays. I, I'm going to say I, I'm a real partial to the water, watershed. Um, do you have a favorite essay in the book? I don't think I could pin it down to one. Uh, I could probably tell you three. Um, I love Rapture because it's one of the most poetic pieces. Uh, and it really talks to me. I also really like um, the essay about Weibo Ludwig. Um, yes. goes way because the first piece that I wrote, I wrote a, that that ero a, that essay arose out of something I'd written for Western Living, and I thought it was a great piece. My editor thought it was a great piece, and then when Weibo died in I can't remember what year, 2012, I sat down and I started thinking about it, and then I wrote the essay that I wished I had written for Western Living. So here it is. It actually ended up in uh, Prairie Fire running in prairie fire so mm -hmm. those, those I, would be my two favorites i think yeah, and I, I believe it won the the the, the non-fiction prize in prairie fire as well yeah. yeah yeah that's a that's an amazing essay like is it the way that you you just do this kind of 
deep dive and it you 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 know you don't stick on the surface and it you bring bringing your dad in there and uh yeah it's it's a really really fine fine essay um i i i, I think there's a lot of humor oh in, good in <laughs> oh, good. oh oh yes yes I, I i always put smiley faces in the margins i don't know it's just a silly thing i i do and uh, again i can't give there's not time to give all the examples but um uh, <laughs> oh, being in love with a with with a st love affair with a wolf, the the oven, um, so awesome. And uh, cabbage gets boring, like uh, watching Hugh Grant play himself in movie after movie, <laughs> like L O L, laugh out loud, and, uh, and so much so much humor and and wit in the essay. So I just I just wanted to remark on that, and uh, I, I I know that I I, sh I should try to ask how do you. <laughs> How do you do that humor? But I know it's it's kind of it kind of is difficult to say. It kind of just happens. But I just say I love I love humor in, in the essays. Thank you. That's a relief. Humor is something that I I sometimes think I'm lacking. I I, I think I'm a pretty funny girl, but you know, in on the page sometimes it is really hard work. So when it comes across as something that fits and is in place, then that's a that's that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Oh, the, the, the oven, the oven essay is, is hilarious. Um, uh, all ovens are different, like dogs. They may look sort of the same, but their temperaments are as different as schnauzers and salukis. But every oven has a hot spot. It took me a few weeks to find it in my bowl. <laughs> it's good, really, really, really. It's wit, you know, it's really, really good. Um, I wonder too, uh, Dee, if you have mentors in the, the essay writing uh, genre. Yes. A couple come right to mind. One, as I said in my in my reading, the late great M. F. K. Fisher, who pretty single-handedly set the standard for what uh, the narrative food writing, and I'm not going to slot myself because she didn't, but writing about food, but where food was the entire garden of life and death, right? Some of her work just moved me to tears, so I'm glad to hear that that has come across in mine. But not only that, you were talking about voice earlier, Annie Dillard, not just uh, in terms of how she touched base with the natural world, but in the cadence and, and, the, and the rhythm and patterning of, of her of her writing. Um, I'm also a big fan as a writer, even though she doesn't write nonfiction, of Annie Pruel. She writes some of the most beautifully complex long sentences and I mean I have tried to write sentences that are a page long and you get tied up in the in the punctuation sometimes, but those are the people who come immediately to mind along with you know Wendell Berry, but uh, I think those the, the other two women have been way more meaningful to me. Uh, as as a writer, as a writer of of memoir and and essay, yeah. I was thinking, yeah, that that, that I was thinking actually about some of the the environmental writers, um, like like Annie Dillard, and you know, um, if I were working in like McNally Robinson or a bookstore, um, and I I think I would be I would have your book, and I would almost be tempted to like, where would you? put it in the bookstore, which section? Sometimes that's kind of interesting to think about. And yes, I'm sure there's a, a food section, but I, I'd be just as inclined to, to um, shelve your book in under, you know, environmental writing or, or cultural studies, or it, it's so much, you know, it's, it's, it's really casts a broad swath over a lot of um, themes, like, like really pressing themes, like, like climate and, and food and, local war am I saying that right is that, uh, yeah I'd, I'd almost be as inclined to, you know to put it with uh, uh, environmental writing as as, as much as of, of food writing um, I just want to remind everyone out there too that you can post questions in the and Sarah will uh, uh, convey them to me through this cool little thing called that text message and then I'll read them back. So I think we'll have questions in a couple of minutes. So don't be shy about, about asking D questions and um, I'll ask D a couple more myself. Um, do, you, um, are, do you have more essays on the go, D? No, I'm not working on essays right now. Uh, the good news is that my MFA thesis that I slaved over for the last eight years since <laughs> I remember that one <laughs> is coming into print next fall. 
So that's wonderful news to me, Dryland Diaries, it's called. Uh, no, actually, um, I, have a, I do have a new book project that I'm starting the research on. It's going to be a pretty deep dive into uh, examining the cultural evolution of food writing. This is, I wrote my MA thesis about yeah. food writing. So it's uh, the evolution of food writing using three influential people as pivots, namely MFK Fisher, Mary Frances mm -hmm. Kennedy Fisher, the American writer, um, Madeline Kamen, who was not only a highly revered chef who set the standard for a whole lot, uh, an entire generation of restaurant chefs. She always aimed at educating restaurant chefs, not so much home cooks. Um, but she also wrote some very important books about food and about women in food. And then the third is the inimitable Anthony Bourdain, the late Anthony Bourdain, who I think had really changed how people think about not just chefs and cooks in the food world, uh, but he, he poked a lot of holes into the, the misogyny in the food world, but he also, uh, his voice was, was so unique and so strong and so clear and so humble. You know, he was a very humble man about his role in the world. And I think that those three have really left their mark on the food world. So I've got um, I've got some time coming up, <laughs> a couple years, uh, where I'm going to be addressing that and doing a lot of reading and hopefully coming up with a manuscript that is going to be um, engaging to a reader who isn't necessarily interested in food writing, but is interested in the culture of food in the world as, as you know, hopefully has come through in this book of essays. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And I remember that some, from your, some of your master's work. And congratulations on your novel coming out. I know it well. And that's so, that's so exciting. Um, so I think that um, we're going to maybe see if um, some folks have some questions. I'll see if anything's in my, in my chat here. And I just want to uh, encourage everyone to get, get their copy of Red and Water. It's not that awful long uh, till Christmas. And, and this is a really, really fabulous book. Um, and it would make great Christmas presents and just, just, just to have it in your, in your library. So um, let's, have, let's see if we have questions. Um, oh, okay. Uh, there, I can see it down the bottom and I can't read the whole thing. Maybe Sarah, you can, you can help me here. It's from Nicole. And I, I don't have it in my, in my chat. Hi there, I'll just uh, unmute myself for a moment. This is Sarah. Actually, there are a few questions that have come in at this point. Um, the first one was from Wild Words North and they asked, uh, they said, recipes and technical skills for writing seem quite aligned. Can you speak about how do you use those recipes and skills to make your own creations? Oh, that's a really good question. It hits both, both fields right on the, you know, those two nails, one hammer, well done. Um, all right, so I've written a lot of recipes, I've written a lot of cookbooks, and the thing about writing recipes and cooking is, first of all, you have to understand methodology, right? It's when you learn to cook, you have to learn how to do things, what the, the basic simple science of cooking is and how things change. And after that, you can start playing around with how flavors work together. In my mind, writing is really similar. You have to understand how to build a good sentence right? Ground zero, how to write a good sentence or how to write a good thought down if you're not, even poetry, you know, I've had it pounded into my head, start with a good sentence. So that's similar to understanding the, the structure and how cooking works. So do that. And then the embellishment can start once you are a better writer, which will take a lot of revision, I promise you, but be bold about it and put it away and let it rest. It's just like making bread, let it rest. Come back when there isn't a charge attached to it and start applying what you have learned about the flavorings that go into writing, all the different ways to add character or add place or add the different levels of meaning and question yourself about what it is this really is trying to say. So absolutely, you start with the basics. You get, you acquire skill, the, the, the ground level skill, and then you build from there. Good question. Are there more questions? I think Sarah is going to curate these. Yeah, I'll just pop on again. Hi, everyone. Uh, so Jen Sharp said, do you have any words of advice for aspiring memoir writers? 
Uh, gee, Jen, that is a good question too. Um, tell the truth, dig deep. Someone, you know, it's been said many times, you open, you, you know, you sit down and you open a vein and bleed on the page. I don't believe you have to bleed on the page, but I believe you have to think really, really deeply so that you're not just telling what happened. It's never about what happened. It's the most, the, the most meaningful stories are about why and how and the people behind it, why things happened the way it did, you know, why I, you know, personally responded to, you know, human beings in this particular way after my particular type of upbringing. So don't ever be satisfied with just saying, okay, here's what happened. I don't want to know that, you know, there, there's lots of stuff that I can just look out and see, well, this is happening. I want to know the underneath story. I, know, I want to know what, what resonates with you and why it matters to you that this is going on the page. And then you tell the truth. As Lee Gutkin can't, said, he, he founded Creative Nonfiction. He said, um, you know, you can't make this stuff up. When you're writing memoir, you're telling the truth. So you tell the deepest truth that you can find. And the reality about telling personal truths is that the personal truths are the most universal ones. Fantastic. Great, Great advice. <laughs> and I, I hear from the, understand from the Starship Enterprise that there are two more questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> <That's good. laughs> oh, it's a strange world. We'll take the, we'll have those two more questions maybe then, and uh, I'll have a final word or two. Um, do we have another question, Sarah? Yes, Nicole has asked, uh, she says, you mentioned earlier that your views on being a parent have changed over time. Since this book really is a journey of a life through food, how have your views of food, cooking in particular, changed from your earliest memories until now? What is the biggest difference in your mind? Keep it simple, sweetie. In a word, keep it simple. When I was a restaurant chef, as every young cook does, we try to get so much jammed onto a plate, crammed into one dish to be representative of everything we think about food and all we want that one dish to represent. But that's just not possible. So I've really stripped my food down and, you know, I'm not cooking for hundreds of people anymore. I feed myself, I feed my family, I feed my friends. And what I cook are the thing, the foods that I like the most, but I also really believe more and more in letting the good ingredients that we spend so much time and effort, as our friend Jen Sharp points out in her wonderful book, the good food we spend so much time sourcing, don't mess them up with too many extraneous ingredients. You know, let, let that focus come through. And it's just like writing, you know, you stay focused on, on where you're going and you just follow that path simply without too much embellishment, right? More excellent writing advice. Thank you. And uh, we'll have one last question, I think. Yes, Karen asks, she says, Dee, you once asked me why and what water meant, the flooding and all. Seems like you figured it out now. What's it come down to? <laughs> Karen, you are one wise woman. Water. Well, water means a lot of things. It's hard to kind of say it only means one thing in this book because it doesn't. It's <sighs> floodwaters coming up and, and receding again. I mean, that's just like the tides in our lives. Things come and go. Friends come and go. All kinds of things pass through our lives that we can only surrender to. I think one of, Jeanette, you asked me earlier, one of about some of these themes, I think for me, one of the themes that I kept coming back to in this was the notion of surrender. Not necessarily in the sense of giving up because I'm damned if I'm going down, you know, without, you know, as big a fight as I can muster, but surrendering, surrendering to the inevitable or surrendering to things we cannot change. And water teaches that lesson. More than anything, living here for seven years, surrounded by water and having it leave and all those beautiful birds leaving as well, was completely out of my control, just like the arrival had been out of my control. So what do you do? You surrender into it and you find a way to take the most pleasure you can out of it, even though there's mosquitoes and riding the ATV in and out in the rain, oh my God. It wasn't all fun or pretty, uh, but it was an experience over all kinds of facets, just like water, just like ice, just like steam, you know, constantly changing and ultimately leaving when it was ready. And, and I go, thank you. What a, what a beautiful note to, to end on, Dee, and 
congratulations again on your book. I hope you have a huge celebration after this. And you've, you've really nourished us with your words. I mean, it's been really, really hard um, the last year and a half. And, and I think your, your book in the world is it, here at, at the perfect moment. And thank you for your beautiful reading. And those are great questions. Thank you, everyone. And University of Regina Press, you are awesome. And the uh, team here tonight. And uh, it's been lots and lots of fun. And uh, I miss everybody. And uh, Dee, um, blessings on your beautiful book. Thank you. Good evening, you. everyone. Thank you, Jeanette. I need. I just need a minute now to say a couple thank yous of my own to again to the the U of R Press team, outstanding, outstanding, hardworking team, all of you, including those behind the scenes that I haven't met, and also to, as I said earlier, ZG Stories, who have worked so hard for me, despite my my struggles. Oh, I should be able to do everything. Well, I just can't. Let it go, right? Thank you, thank you all, and I just want to add. If you are interested in a signed copy, a personalized copy, you know, reach out to me personally and I'll, I can make that happen. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to celebrate. I wish you were here to celebrate with me. Um, please, you know, feed somebody you love.